Hi, it's Brynn. We're going to do another little episode about prison reform. Today we have Ken LeMaster with us, and I'm going to let him tell his story because he's been in the correctional system for 30 years, but not as an inmate. He's been a CO and many other things. So tell us a little bit how you got your, how you got your start, why you do what you do, and then I've got some pretty good questions for you. Started my career in 1979 as a correction specialist at the United States Military Prison in Fort Leavenworth. Oh, yeah, which uh, is now closed, right? Yes. Uh, they built a new facility in the back side of me. I worked in the old facility that was known as the Castle. Mm -hmm. uh, graduated from that for, for just under a year at the Kansas State Penitentiary in Lansing that uh, is now closed. Right. Uh, it seems I'm um, growing a you're closing here. prisons. <laughs> and then I spent 27 years at the United States Penitentiary at Leavenworth, Kansas, as a correctional officer, and then finished my career as a material handler supervisor and the institution's historian. Wow. So in all, I had just under 32 years when I retired in 2010. Wow. So I have... Uh, what made you want to get into it? I don't think I was sitting on my dad's lap one of these, you know, back in the day thinking, hey, dad, I want to be a correctional officer. Well, I grew up, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was just like everybody else at the age of 18 back in the Need day. Job. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to college, and my dad had passed away when I was 15 years old. Oh, wow. So I joined the Army. Mm hmm. Uh, scored 97 on my ASVAB test, so I could have been just about anything. Right. Uh, I wanted to be in the military, decided I wanted to join the MP Corps, and the recruiter came back and looked at me and he says, you want to join the MP Corps? And I said, yeah, sure, sounds like fun. And he says, well, you know, the only openings right now we have are in the corrections field. Well, I'll try that. Yeah. They sent me off into Fort McClellan, Alabama. I, uh, completed basic training, went through the corrections school in about seven days. Wow, that's it? Yep. Wow. Uh, then I was a holdover there for a while, so they sent me through part of the uh, regular MP school. I worked with the uh, CID school in their lie detector course and while I was waiting for orders. That's then, very interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, we actually went and committed crimes, and then they put us on a lie detector to see afterwards. If you could tell if they were lying. Yeah. Were <laughs> uh, they accurate? Uh, they were with me, I guess. I'm, I'm not born to lie, I guess. Good for you. So after that, I got orders to Fort Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. You know, the drill sergeants always said that, you know, you keep screwing up, we're going to send you to Leavenworth. <laughs> I've been here now for over 40 years. It's home. <laughs> yeah. So I got to Leavenworth and did the initial training coming into the facility. Uh, got into working at the facility first, uh, the 10 to 6 shift, mm -hmm. 23 days into my career. Uh, we're clearing a dining room one morning, and my first true experience with an inmate, he, uh, back in that era when you cleared the dining room, all of the officers went in the front of the dining room, up by the serving line, and you walked back towards the, the exit of the dining room. Mm -hmm. And as you're walking back, there's not supposed to be an inmate behind you as you're walking back. You're telling them it's time to go. And, and how you determine that is, is the last inmate that sets down, 20 minutes from the last inmate setting down, you start to clear the dining room. Right. So if we're walking back, this inmate is sitting there, and I told him it's time to go. And he tells me, you best be cool around me. Oh, he was the boss, huh? And I said, dude, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. He says, I told you, you best be cool around me. Well, he said, the other guys are keeping moving. I'm engaging with this individual. <laughs> and as everybody's getting to the back, I, I look over at him. I said, look, it's time to go. And the guy used a few choice words that may not want to be in his interview. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, look, we're going out to the main court and we're going out to the bench. The bench was, the castle was similar to the federal prison, it had a rotunda mm -hmm. in the center of it. And inmates went to the bench as a disciplinary 
wait right. while you wrote a incident report mm -hmm. and waited for the guard commander. Right. Well, this inmate jumps up and the first thing I noticed is there's something shiny in his hand. That's all I saw. Wow. And it was up over the top of my head. My first reaction was this. I threw my arm up in the air. And when I threw my arm up in the air, he stabbed me going up my arm. Wow, so you had an incident early on in your career. Uh, well, you know, I like to get things out of the way early in my career. <laughs> what you're going to be up against. Yeah. <laughs> so I started moving backwards at right angles, trying to get around him. Uh, unfortunately, he kept cutting my path off. Wow, he's quick. And back in that era, we used the old battleship trays. And I noticed that something shiny was laying on the table and I grabbed it and threw it. Well, when I threw it, it hit the wall and the last man going out of the dining room happened to hear this noise and he turned around and he looked and, and well, here comes the cavalry back and we subdued the inmate and mm -hmm. took him to base and well, segregation. Right. And, and all was fine and well and I guess since I got that out of the way early, I just settled into the career. <laughs> you knew what to expect. Yeah, yeah, it's like, well, I got that out of the way, so. We were talking earlier about, uh, you know, everybody talks about rehab, rehabilitation, and why don't you tell them a little bit about your thoughts on that? What I was talking about was, is maybe rehabilitation is probably the most overused and misunderstood word I agree. in the entire correctional field. The word rehabilitation means to put something back into its original form. If it's grown up in an environment and raised in an environment of violence, uh, crime, right, gangs, gangs, whatever. Mm -hmm. whatever it's raised in, if it's raised in a, as a malcontent, That's it's going know. to be a malcontent no matter what you do. Right. The word to habilitate is probably a better road to try to teach and train an individual a better way of life. Mm -hmm. That there's something different out there than what he what is. They've known. Mm -hmm. they've known. Absolutely. And another thing that's misunderstood in, in prison situations are most people's ideology of a correctional officer is that the term guard. Yes. There's a difference between a guard and a correctional officer. There is. Anybody can guard something. Mm -hmm. You can stand there and guard that door. Right. I can stand here to guard this table. That doesn't have to have anything to do with corrections. It doesn't have anything to do. You're physically standing here watching this. That's not what a correctional officer does. Right. A correctional officer is more trained. You have to have some type of training in interpersonal communications. Absolutely. When a police officer is on the street, he has accessibility to a lot of other things that a correctional officer doesn't. Right. There's no outside world stuff in there. There's no, no. You, have, you have your radio and that's about it. Uh, and a lot of facilities today have gone to uh, allowing officers to carry pepper spray. Some facilities allow officers to carry stun, uh, um, stun guns. Yeah. Uh, back when I started, correctional officers didn't even carry handcuffs. Oh, well, because wow. the fear was is, is that uh, if something breaks out of a cell house, handcuffs, they could handcuff you. Mm -hmm. They could. And you were probably going to wind up dead. Yeah, because you couldn't get away. You couldn't get away. They could handcuff you to a handrail. They could handcuff you to a whatever, and, and you're probably going to wind up dead. Right. Um, Anything that you have on your person as a correctional officer, they could take and use against you. At any time. One of the uh, books that, that was written several years ago uh, about the New Mexico prison riot was called The Hate Factory. Mm. 36 hours at Santa Fe, 
Uh, it's still considered to this day one of the most brutal prison riots in U.S. history. Oh, man. Uh, anybody, if you can find a copy of the book, it will give you a great idea of how brutal prison can be. Right. Uh, not only what they did to the inmates during that 36 hours that they murdered, but what they did to the correctional officers. Yeah, it wasn't just inmates. It wasn't just correctional officers. And, and they brutalized, they, right. they brutalized uh, the staff, they brutalized the inmates. And, and you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that just don't understand what prison life is. No, they don't. They, they take a look at a 1930s prison movie mm -hmm. and they think to themselves, well, these guys are guards, they're knuckle draggers. They're, they're one step above or one step below what they're watching. Right. They all carry clubs. We beat inmates on a daily basis. <laughs> uh, it's so far from the truth. Yes. And, and it's so far from the truth, we don't beat inmates on a daily basis. Uh, you have to have some kind of commonality. You also have to have communication them. skills. You, you have to have communication skills. And, and, you know, sure, we have every occupation mm -hmm. from doctors, lawyers, all the way down to ditch diggers have your, your bad apples. Yeah, that's true. Corrections is no different. Yep. We have our dirty cops, just like the cops on the street, mm -hmm. uh, that... 3% of dirty cops makes the 97% that they're out there right. doing the best they can. There, I mean, just my personal experience, there was a lot of COs that actually cared about the inmates. They, and, and there was that occasional one that you might have actually smiled if somebody hit them. <laughs> you know, yeah. Unfortunately, but uh, yes. I, I always treated inmates like a human being. Yes. Until they, uh, until they didn't want to act like a human being. But that was their choice. And, and even at the point in time when they didn't want to act like a human being, I was still talking to them. Mm -hmm. What's the worst thing you saw? I know you've seen a lot being in it that long. I mean, I had, had a front row seat to several murders. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I've seen almost two total decapitations. Wow. Uh, hmm. It's hard to pick pick one. Seen the um, seen the murder of a up close and personal of a Aryan Brotherhood president. Mm. Seen the murder of a uh, Northern California drug lord. Wow, and murder's murder. I mean, it's still an individual. Oh yeah, and then you know the one thing: the higher up levels of penitentiaries that you work at, and I look, three penitentiaries that I work at were all maximum security mm -hmm. facilities. Yeah, when you said Leavenworth, it's not maximum anymore, but it was. And, and I was there in 2005 when they changed it from maximum mm -hmm. security to a medium. And uh, when I first started at Leavenworth between 1985 and 1987, 88, you're talking a span of four to five years, there was uh, 18 homicides Ooh. inside the institution and it got to I was actually involved in the first homicide. It was actually captured on video Man. inside the facility. Uh, there was a incident where an inmate, two inmates walked through coming back from chow at lunchtime, going back into the uh, shoe factory. And they walked into the shoe factory. Don one uh, had his arm around the other one was talking to him and probably Three minutes later, one of the staff from the shoe factory opened the door and screamed he needed help. And, uh, I mean, they walked through the metal detector from the shoe factory probably 50 feet. And did the job. And uh, when we got there, the one inmate that had his arm around the other one had used a seamstress razor blade, which is a one-sided razor blade. Mm -hmm. Uh, had slit this guy's throat all the way to the spinal column. Oh my goodness. 
and was standing yeah. there trying to kick his head off. That's that's massive. Um, that's a lot of force on a little razor blade. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean the 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 one guy that had killed uh, probably the one that I had the <laughs> the biggest front row seat to was the. Uh, the murder of a, uh, a white inmate killing a black inmate, and it was basically over a radio. We had a, a cell house, one of the smaller cell houses. He had, uh, at nine o'clock at night, they would have a, uh, what we called a soft lockdown at nine o'clock. The inmates wanted to get locked down at nine o'clock and get an early, right. you know, go to bed or whatever. We'd lock down at nine o'clock and then we'd station an officer at the stairwells to keep the rest of the inmates that wanted to stay out and watch whatever right. it was. From they interrupting were, them. Right. From interrupting them. Well, the, the inmate would go up to his cell up on the top floor and turn on the radio and start singing and dancing in his cell. And uh, acting a fool. Mm -hmm. The old boys from the mafia were on the first floor sent uh, one of the guys that wanted to uh, blood in with the, with the Aryan Brotherhood mm -hmm. up there to tell him one night to knock it off and a guy told him to get away from the cell I'll make a punk out of you. Wow. Well, before anything gets hit like that they send out feelers to talk to hey, you know, is this guy part of your group? Is this guy, be, you know, we want to hit this guy. You know, the guys with the nation. Get permission, kind of. You yeah. know, the guys with the nation of Islam and everybody. This guy ain't with riding with us. We don't care. He was kind of on his own. The guy came in the cell house a couple of days, and then about two weeks after the proposed argument started, this guy walks in the cell house, coming back from dinner. Uh, walks in the cell house. He's got his normal routine. He walks in, goes to one side of the bottom floor looks to see what's on TV and didn't see anything there. And he walks all the way across back to the other side, looks to see what's on TV over there. And as he comes around the lockbox to that gallery, uh, the white inmate comes out from around the lockbox and starts stabbing him. Yeah. And, as, and he's stabbing him with uh, a shank that's about 15, 16 inches long. Where did he find the material to make it out of? Uh, where there's a will, there's a way. That's right. That, that is, there's, there's truth in that statement. <laughs> and, and, you know, when you've got time, uh, mother, uh, the, the, the necessities, the mm -hmm. mother of they all inventions. Think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and all the people are out there listening to this. If you don't think that uh, you can't make a shank out of anything but steel, you're totally wrong. That's right. Plastic, I've wood. Seen I've seen, mm -hmm. I've seen the handiest shank made out of a rolled up trash bag. Oh, wow. Uh, you take a trash bag and melt it down and Makes it hard. get it stiff and work it out on a concrete cinder block wall and uh, no time flat, you got the... I wouldn't have even thought of that. Yeah. I wouldn't have even thought about that. What kind of mental state does that leave you in, seeing all that stuff? That's got to be hard. You don't come out of an environment like that the same way you went in it, no matter whether you're That's, yeah. only doing eight hours at a time or you're doing a lifetime at a time. Right. Right. And that's on either side, either the inmate or the CO or any prison employee for that matter. It, 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 it leaves a, it, it changes a human being. Yeah. You see the worst. And a lot of people, you probably see some good too. I'm not saying that there's not, there's some good in there, but we were at a maximum security prison where these people have created and committed and done these massive things, you know, murder and I mean, violence. And you put there's them all the, together. There's a lot of guys that won't talk about it. There's the, yeah. they, they, and, and to be quite honest with you, I found talking about it. Uh, probably helps. Gets it out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I still do loss prevention for a uh, business in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had at least one incident that has dug up a few demons from the past. I bet. I bet. 
that bad. It's kind of the same field, loss prevention. Well, it, I mean, it's not the same field, but it kind of it leads you to the same type of individual that's being incarcerated. One yeah, of the things that one of the things that most people don't ever hear about the correction side of or the, the, the what the toll of corrections has or the, the job has on people. Uh, correctional officers suffer PTSD at a rate three times more than a combat veteran that has multiple deployments. I could see that. Uh, their alcoholism rate mm -hmm. is higher. Uh, the divorce rate mm -hmm. uh, ranks in, in, in the top 10. Well, just the, their the life environment makes it it's just so unhappy. Their, their life expectancy is usually their 57th birthday is their last. Wow. Their suicide rate is phenomenal. Yeah, I, I can see why, you know, it, on, on both sides, especially if you have an inmate that's in there for life or a CO who has witnessed all these things time and time and time again. It kind of makes you lose faith in the human world. It really does. And, well, and the way that they behave on a regular basis, especially that type when you, of person. Especially when you, you, you think about it and you look at what you're dealing with. Most people just equate murderers and drug dealers. Right. There's so much more. Uh, I dealt with the 1994 World Trade Center bombers. Mm. Uh, I dealt with the order. Right. I dealt with members of the Branch Davidians. Hmm. Uh, I've dealt with uh, the Aryan Nation. Yeah, you had some pretty top dogs coming through there. I have uh, dealt with uh, Tommy Silverstein, Russell Buffalino, Christian David. Wow. Uh, there's a book out called uh, The Murder Machine. Oh, I might have to check that out. I dealt with all of them. Uh, Tommy Silverstein would have probably been, and, and his uh, best friend Clayton Fountain. Uh, you talk to both of them, if you're sitting across the table from either one of them and having a conversation with either one of them, the best way to describe talking to them is they're, they're having a normal conversation with you. But when you're looking into their eyes, it's like looking into an abyss. Really? Wow, they're they're that far gone. They are, uh, they're holding a normal conversation with you, but in the entire conversation that they're having with you inside their brain, they're trying to figure a way of how they can kill you. Right, that, that would be scary. That would be scary. They're trying to kill you and they're trying to manipulate you into letting your guard down. Right. They're just waiting for that opportunity. And they're studying the room, they're studying you, they're studying your actions, what you're saying, your mannerisms, so they can know how to do it. And, and it's, it, it's... Methodical. But, and, and they are. And I always tell people, I have dealt with people that I could bring two guys into a room filled with 75 people mm -hmm. in just a social environment. You can read the room. Let them spend the evening just socializing mm -hmm. with people. At the end of the night, have these people sit down. I could have these two people at the front of the room and I could ask them one question. Which ones in this room would make the best victims and why? 
So, and they'd be able to tell you just from what they witnessed. And they could tell you. Well, from their experience. Yes. It's because an experienced criminal mm -hmm. is a predatory animal. Yes, I, you're right. They're looking for it. They yeah. know what to look for. Yep. They know. And they know how to execute it. They know how to exploit it. Mm -hmm. Yep. They know how to it. They know how to come at you. They know what to look for. And, and particularly, and I know this is going to sound bad. Sorry. Uh, no, it is what it is. I want I want you to be real and honest and raw. That's that's um, what we want. If you're if it's a male. Mm -hmm. They know exactly how to approach a female. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they do. And if it's a female, they know exactly how to approach a male. Yep. Yep. And it, and, they studied and, it. And nine times out of ten, it has nothing to do with sexuality. Right. It's behavior, mannerisms. It's, it, it, it's yes. exactly, it, it, there's, sex is the most farthest. But we tend to think that that's what it is. Well, it's it's Hollywood's version. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Hollywood's version is, is, is the sexualization of how they manipulate you. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, it's not sex is the last thing they they, they, they care about. It's it's right. it's not the sex. It's 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 all about what I can get out of you. Right, right. And in that if environment, sex, it, it even strengthens that. You know, I, I watched the, the stories of uh, John Maynard and Toby Young. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to be quite honest with you. And Toby Young don't know how close she was to being dead. Oh, I, yeah, I bet. She probably will never know. No, know. she don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if the second that John Maynard found a 25-year-old sweet thing, Toby Young has been out of the picture. Right. I'm telling you, people don't realize and, 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 how and it really wouldn't have been a, it really wouldn't have been a, about the sex with her either. No, not at that stage, huh? No. Right. What you know, we were talking about these these people about rehabilitation versus habilitation. Mm -hmm. In a maximum security facility, is the average person there ever going to be able? to come out and be a productive member of society. The average person. Because not all of them are lifers. It's very few and far between, mm -hmm. simply because by the time they get there, that is usually not their first rodeo. Right, hence maximum security. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most of them have a lengthy career in, in different uh, levels of incarceration. Right. Uh, Which has led them to where they ultimately ended up. Mm -hmm. I've had two incidences in my career where uh, the one guy, everybody knew he shouldn't have been there. Uh, the guy had been, uh, he was a black man. He was <sighs> probably mid 60s when I got there mm -hmm. in 83. I can remember everybody called him chief. I'm not exactly for sure why they called him chief, but it, it was his, it was what it's everybody called thing. him. Mm -hmm. I mean, even staff called him chief. Oh, wow. Um, that's probably why I don't even remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of nicknames in there and that's what people get called. But everybody called him chief. Uh, I do remember the case. Uh, he was, uh, it was right around, right around either during the late stages of World War II or right after World War II. He was working as a painter on, I believe, it was Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I worked there for seven years. And uh, he was having an affair with a daughter of a white army officer. Which was taboo. 
and he was married and had a daughter. And dad discovered them having sex mm -hmm. and uh, made his teenage daughter swear up and be down that she was raped. Oh. And uh, the guy was sentenced because he was on a military reservation and yeah. he was working as a civilian. Mm -hmm. It was a federal crime. He got sent straight to Leavenworth, spent <laughs> almost 40 years at Leavenworth. That's a long time. And unfortunately for this guy, and I mean, all of us knew that everybody you ever talked to that knew this guy knew this guy mm -hmm. was railroaded. Right. It happens. And, it every, happen. it, and, and there's cases where parole board uh, members and stuff that, that had wrote, uh, you know, this guy shouldn't be here. Shouldn't be We'd always been that. railroaded. But because dad had forced his daughter to swear up and be down, he would, she would never reveal the truth. Wow. Well. I wonder what she was going through knowing that. Well, dad died at the ripe old age of 90-something. Long time. And finally, when dad died, she went to the prosecutor, and which, how many years, how many prosecutors could there be in 47 years? A lot. And, and finally told the prosecutor, my dad forced me to lie. I wonder if she got any trouble for that. And, I, you know, I don't think she did, but. Yeah. Uh, so they, they let him out? And she went to the prosecutor and told the prosecutor in, in the, that jurisdiction that my father forced me to lie when I was whatever she was, eight, 17, 18 years old, whatever, right. and made me swear up and be down this guy raped me when in all actuality we were in love at the time and it was all consensual it was all consensual and he didn't rape me at all and that they, had to mess her up no it did mm -hmm. it probably had an effect on her mm -hmm. so that, did they let him out after that yeah they they left it they let him out I can, I can remember even him telling me that you know and, and the guy was not the smartest individual on the planet. I mean, he, I'm, and I don't want to sound like I'm being derogatory to the guy. Right. Uh, he, he told me, he says, you know, he says, Mr. Lemaster, if I could make just $200 a month, I'd be fine. And we're talking the 1980s. Right. I mean, this guy's whole concept of the world was still in 1940, whatever. It's because that's all he knew. That's all he, he knew. He left that environment and it stayed with him when he came out. And his daughter came and picked him up and the uh he was working last we did last i knew he was working news a newsstand in the dallas fort worth airport and they made him the manager of all the newsstands in the dallas fort worth news oh wow so you uh, did get to get yeah. a decent job afterwards, yeah. So I mean, it, I mean, I'm sure the guy's probably passed by now. Right. So I mean, uh, he went on to a better life. So you've seen the people who should be locked up for life, and you've seen the people who got dealt with. And, 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 yeah. and he finally, you know, saying it took 40 years. Yeah. I mean, when the guy got finally got let out, we were like, should have already happened. It, it, this, think parole would have let him out. Well. It, and it was that whole situation of where, you know, even the parole board was like, this guy needs to be gone. He needs to be out of here. Yeah, you know, today, but, rapists but, don't get that kind of time. And the prosecution was like, the family is still pressing the case and, and mm -hmm. it was the politics and... There's a lot of politics in it. Uh, for better lack of terms, the BS of it all. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of it. That, that kept him there. And, and finally... Sadly, 40, she had to wait till her dad died to do it. Yeah, mm -mm. And, and then the one guy that uh, <laughs> I always told this guy that you know, for some reason, he just had the poorest luck of all because every time he screwed up, I was there, right? Uh, and I just looked at him, and finally, I just got to the point to where just you know, just go away. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you do. You get to know them. You know you're there every day with them. I, I just look at him and say, you know, don't ever grow up to be a gambler. Just go away. <laughs> do you ever see any of them? And, 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 well, you and ever this, see them out of prison? Well, this guy, he was, me and him were about the same age, and he was getting out of prison. And, and he, and I sat him in the hallway, and he, and he looked at me and he says, well, you won't have to put up with me anymore. And I looked at him and said, Jesus Christ, thank God. <laughs> and, and, and he just kind of laughed. And, and he, he said, I said, what are you, I said, you're getting out. And he says, yeah. And I said, well, that's good. And I said, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm going back to Omaha, Nebraska. And I said, you got family there? And he says, no. And he says, mom and dad are dead. And he says, my brothers and sisters don't want to have anything to do with me. Yeah, there's a lot of that that goes on. And I sat there and I said, so why are you going back to Omaha, Nebraska? And he says, well, that's where I grew up. I said, so what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, really, I don't know right at this point. And he said, I said, so you're going back to the same place you grew up? And he said, well, yeah. I said, so you're going back to a place that nobody wants to have anything to do with you, but the guys that you hung around with, that you got in trouble with to begin with, still there. the police know you, and you have no prospects before you get there which means that you'll probably wind up back right. here. Exactly, and you know, our and, system sets them up for that too. And, and he looked at me and he was kind of like, eh, well, I know, I said, well, okay. Have you set your parole in stone? No, why don't you parole to Kansas City? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you start over either way. I said, why don't you parole to Kansas City? I said, I know the pro, I said, I know CNC produce, uh, hires. I know the pro some of the other produce companies hire down in Kansas City. Uh, some of the other jobs down there in that area hire as well. I said, why don't you give that a shot? Did he take your advice? Uh, well, I didn't know at the time what he did. Mm -hmm. About, I don't know, two years later, I'm down in Kansas City and I run into this guy. And he, and he hollers at me. And I look up and he's walking towards me and I'm thinking, well, he's either, <laughs> I don't know what he's gonna do. <laughs> he's gonna knock me upside the head or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he walks up to me and he says, hey, I took your advice. I said, what? And he says, I, he says, I paroled to Kansas City. I said, well, good. I said, where are you working? And he told, I, I could be where you working now if I had to. And I said, well, good. And he said, I got somebody I want you to meet. And I said, who? He says, he says I, my wife. I said, really? He says, yeah, we just got married a couple weeks ago. We were talking. He introduced me. And he says, he says uh, you know, the guy told you that every time I screwed up, you got my ass and uh, told me I needed to get my head out of my ass. And, mm -hmm. or That's how he introduced you? Yeah. <laughs> he says, but... He says, this is the guy that, you know, he says, if I hadn't asked you to come, I always got it. But he says, after it was done and over with, it that was, it was over with. with. Yes. Uh, he never lied to me. If I had it coming, I got it. If I didn't have it coming, I didn't. He never treated me any less than a human being. That's good. There's a lot of COs that, that do act like that. He said, he gave me the greatest advice that anybody ever gave me anywhere. So if he'd have went back to Omaha, he'd been right back in the system. So by going to Kansas City, now he's living a productive life, got married, and he took your advice. Yeah. And I was kind of like, hmm. That's wonderful. And about two years later, I seen him again, and he's got two kids. Mm -hmm. Bought his first house. Good for him. Yeah, if they want to, like you said, even with the negative stuff, finding yeah. a way to do a shank, if there's a will goes away, and that even it yeah. means by change, yeah. So, one person. Yeah. One person out of the thousands. Well, you know what? It's that one person that matters. Sure. Because those thousands are going to just keep going right back in if they don't want to change. Absolutely. Yeah, I died. And it was kind of one of those, uh, when I first seen him, I was kind of like, hmm. <laughs> it makes you wonder, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, let's see what he's going to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting in Perkins one night, uh, me and another, officer and my family and his family were all sitting down there having dinner. I look up and here comes these 
three guys and their families and all of them had been in a cell house in a federal prison. Mm -hmm. One of them looks up and looks at me and the other officer is sitting across the table from me and his back's to him. I'm just sitting there and he comes walking towards the table and he's like halfway across the restaurant when he sees me and he comes walking across the table and I just have to reach. I'm just sitting there and I just kind of casually. Yeah. <laughs> Not knowing what to expect. I'm sitting there. I know he's with the Hells Angels. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there. He comes walking up to me. Hey, Mr. LeMaster, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Red? Mm -hmm. And as soon as I said red, my buddy sat across the table. He knew who I was talking to. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there talking, or standing, and he's talking. We talked for a few minutes back and forth. And he sat there and he says, I just want to say hi, see how you were doing. He says, we're doing great. And just stop by to eat. You all have a great day. But you didn't know if that was going to go that way or not. Yeah, and I mean, he's going on and he sat there and he says, oh, by the way, he says, you can put that away. He says, we left ours in, on the bikes. <laughs> They're not even supposed to have them. Yeah. <laughs> and I sat there and I said, well, you know, it, it's that uh, always prepared thing. And he says, yeah, I know. And he said, I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. He has a good attitude about it. Yeah. He, he, he says, I can understand. I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some people, though, that you had the conversation with him mm -hmm. and you let him be himself. Sure. But you were prepared if, if himself was going to go the wrong way. Right. But it didn't go that way and you still addressed him like he was a person. There's some that won't even talk. You know, they'll come in and I'll just, oh, I hope they don't see me. You know? Well, and I mean, there are, I mean, my wife and my son know that, that I won't sit with my back to a door. Yeah. My husband and my uh, dad's the same way, not because of that, but the same way. Uh, they also know that, that uh, there are key things I'll say. Let's be on guard. That, that if, if, I, if I say certain things, it tells them where they need to be uh, right. to get you, out of the way. Were you ever in a situation where you feared for your life? Other I know you talk, talked about that first time, but was there another situation that you really feared for your life that could have really went bad? Probably the, the I mean, there's been numerous times that, that you look back on and you think, boy, that could have been, <laughs> that could have really went south in, in a hurry. Uh, Kansas State Penitentiary, Thanksgiving Day. Uh, it would have been Thanksgiving Day, 1982. We were uh, bringing the cell houses out for Thanksgiving dinner. Emmett comes out of a cell house. I was standing on the front porch of the dining room, watching the inmates come out of the dining room, kind of monitoring traffic. Emmett comes out of the door of a cell house. Inmate comes out behind him. And as he comes out behind this inmate, I see his hand come up. And as his hand comes up, he hits him in the back of the neck. Mm. And as he hits him in the back of the neck, he grabs his head. I see the shank come out of his neck. And he pulls him over like this and pulls backwards. And he had obviously shanked the guy in the back of the neck. And he come out in the front of his neck. And this guy had worked his shank to the point and had a serrated back half of the blade. Oh my goodness. And he had cut literally the whole side of his neck up. Did he survive? No. That's this there's guy was, no way he could that <laughs> thing, yeah. The, this guy was dead before he ever realized he was dead. Oh my goodness. Um, and the guy looked up at me. He realized that I had seen the whole thing. Uh, and I mean, at the whole time this is transpiring, I can hear the tower officer right above me trying to get a window open. I know what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, <laughs> he's trying to get this window open. Now you're talking about a hundred, at that point in time, probably about a 140 year old prison. 
Yeah, it doesn't he's, want to open. <laughs> he's trying to get this window open frantically. And the inmate looks up at me and he starts walking towards me. Mm. Uh, and I'm kind of standing there on the front porch thinking to myself, okay, the door's locked to my left. There's a lot of street to my back. What am I going to do here? Mm hmm been stabbed once. I didn't particularly care for that. So, hmm. Hmm. This is, and at that point in time, I was fairly young, fairly, a lot slimmer than I am now. Uh, I was fairly proficient in Aikido at that point in time because I'd learned, uh, I'd been special operations and response. And we, I was part of the initial special operations response trained people. I was part of that pilot program and we trained in that stuff. So I'm thinking, okay, I can do, this guy's got a pretty hefty shank that looks like something Rambo would carry. <laughs> and I'm not sure I want to fight with this guy. And this guy's having a hell of a time getting a window open. Well, this guy's closing and closing on me fast. So I'm sitting there thinking, hmm. I, you gotta make, you gotta decide what you're gonna do. And I'm kind of slowly backing up, hoping this window gets open pretty quick. And all of a sudden, uh, Everybody knows what the, what, what the sound of an 870 Winchester makes when the slide goes back and forward. Right. I hear that and I'm thinking, thank God, Mr. Winchester. And, they, and Jake Maupin, who's the officer's name, he blows that window into about a million pieces. Wow. And the inmate takes off down the yard, down the street right. towards the yard. And Jake pulls up the uh, 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 they call them ranch rifles. Mm -hmm. And just as soon as he pulls the trigger on that rifle, that inmate turns the corner onto the yard. Oh wow. And of course, now, because I know what he looks like, I gotta go down and find him. Mm -hmm. Well, a bunch of other people. Right. Uh, well, somebody else carts the guy off to the, the hospital and, and we go down and we get the guy and recover the weapon, mm -hmm. which is the wildest <laughs> looking thing I've ever seen. And probably the wildest. But it did the job, and, yeah, I mean, It's probably the wildest shank I ever did see. Uh, and imagination. Yeah. The uh, incident in the dining room at the state where the guy walks into the dining room, it's the middle of July. And June, July, it's, anyway, it's hot in Kansas in June and July. Mm -hmm. And everybody's in shirt sleeves. And I look up and this guy walks in. I'm in the middle, I mean, I'm almost dead center of the dining room. And there's a captain by the name of Pete Swartz standing probably from here to 10 feet away from me. And I look up and this guy comes walking in the dining room. He's got a winter coat on. Okay, first of all, if something like that, that That's sticks out like a sore yeah. thumb. You know, the, the, the foghorn on the Titanic ain't that loud. Right. I look up and before I could even reach out and grab Pete, I see this guy do this. And that's not a good sign either. No, uh-uh. And he's walking up behind this inmate whose back is to him. And I see this thing come up over the top of his head. It looks like a sword. And he takes this guy's head from here to here. Woo! In one fell swoop. Uh, and everybody in the dining room just goes silent. Yeah, I mean, what, what really can you say at that stage of the game? 900 inmates in a dining room silent is not the greatest thing on the planet either. No, it's not. The people are thinking. Not. And we're all just kind of like... What's next? <laughs> stay tuned, folks. It's going to get interesting. The guy sitting right next to the one table over the next reaches over, grabs this guy's plate, keeps eating. Oh my goodness. Like it didn't even phase him. The weapon was a 
arm off of a paper cutter. Oh, that's those are sharp. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the 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 other incident that uh, and this was well, this this was probably the biggest uh, another uh, video moment here. Pucker factor mm -hmm. uh, was the day that <laughs> I was standing in the dining room. And this guy just arbitrarily walks up. Uh, it was hamburger day. We have probably 15, 1600 inmates in a dining room. It's a lot in one place. It's lunch. And this guy just arbitrarily walks up and knocks the living snot out of John Stanford the head of the, Phil the South Philadelphia crime family. Out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere, just absolutely knocks him flat on his behind. So did that cause a riot or people just continued like nothing happened? Instantaneous. <sighs> Couldn't believe it. So I grabbed the guy. I'm on the floor with him. Another guy is on the floor with John Stanfa. We start looking around and every single solitary inmate within 25 feet of us has a shank. Oh man. What happened? What happened next? We're all looking around. And this is when interpersonal communications is the greatest tool of invention. Yeah. Guys, we got this. I'm taking this down to the hole. Stamp is going over to the hospital. We're going to get this taken care of. Mm-hmm. I cuffed the guy and I started backing him out the door. I started backing him <laughs> and, 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 and I'm like, we're all the way back to the, the two thirds of the way into the dining room. Yeah, so you weren't close to the door. No. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of like, and I mean, we've got other staff that are now standing around, but it's like, right, guys, go back to what you're doing. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Stanford's not in front. We're just going to make sure he's okay. This guy's going to a hole. Wow. Wow. The, the guy that was supposed to be guarding Stanford comes running up there and I looked at him and said, you're a bit late to the party. Yeah. Uh, I bet you, you know where you're supposed to be in a couple of minutes. Yeah. I suggest you probably want to be there in a couple of minutes. Right. Right. Hmm. And he was. He went towards the lieutenant's office and locked up. Yeah. Because he never he screwed up. Well, he is. let the old man get hit. Yep. And that means they're coming after him next. And I'm like, he's going to pay for what he screwed up. And somebody's going. To, he's just going to get his ass beat. What's going to happen? But it's just, yeah. it's still one of those like. It's going to happen. Yeah, we know. Just when. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just kind of like one of those, uh, <laughs> when you turn around and all of a sudden, it's like, hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, we've got some good stories from you today. We're going to probably come back for right about an hour. But tell me something good about the prison system. With all that's going on in the news today about the Bureau of Prisons, mm -hmm. particularly, with the current news of all of the bad things, mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems with the Bureau of Prisons in this era You've got good staff, mm -hmm. 
The Bureau of Prisons is woefully understaffed. They are. And that makes it dangerous for both the inmate and the it does. officer. Right. Mm -hmm. The institution in Atlanta. There's bring, a lot going on in Atlanta. They, they've taken all of the inmates out of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. the, the finding of the cell phones, the finding of the gun, the finding of, of all of the, the contraband that they have Except found. they're not telling it. <laughs> the, the, the dirty staff that have been told, uh, here's the file we have on you. It's either time you resign or we're going to prosecute you. Right. Um, they shouldn't have even been given that choice. The, 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 it all started with uh, whatever the guy's name that hung himself in MCC New York. Uh, of course, the news media is out of control because they're going to That's spend always. whatever mm -hmm. story that, that they're going to spend. Gonna sell the news. Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever's going to sell the story. Uh, Hillary Clinton's lynch mob strung him up. <laughs> whatever. Uh, whatever. Uh, the, the whole shebang, and then, you know, now you've got a warden that, that has sexually, you know, sexual misconduct with female inmates. Uh, right before I retired, you had the lieutenant that killed a U.S. Marshal, I believe it was, down in Talladega when they when he was sexually abusing female inmates, and in, in, or not down in Florida, one of the institutions down in Florida. There's always dirty staff. You, you in my 32 year career, the in any industry, the, though. the year before I retired, a couple of us that had been around forever was in annual training and we were sitting there talking and we actually compiled a list of everybody we could remember that had been walked out of the institution. Wow. Um, and in our career, which, which pretty much basically spanned uh, the same course, we came up with 36 names. That's a lot. Uh, but when you figure 36 out how of, many uh, years and how many people that's not a lot yeah, yeah it's not a lot so I mean uh, you have good people working the biggest problem here is when you have people when I started work at Leavenworth there was almost 700 people working in the facility right in an institution that was holding 18 to 1900 inmates. You had industries working. Mm -hmm. You had other programs that were working. Federal Prison Industries is a ghost town. Mm -hmm. You have maybe 300 staff working in an institution that is holding 1700 inmates. Yeah, it's not enough. It's not enough. Right. I responded to an institution emergency the year before I retired on a Sunday evening. I was the third staff member to arrive at the institution because only I was in sports field when the powerhouse whistle went off. Mm -hmm. We had two rival gangs going at it on the yard. Oh my. That's huge. <laughs> when I got to the institution, I was the third staff member to get there at the time and they were running open population with 10 staff on shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't keep your staff safe, you can't keep the inmates safe at that. In school kill, at school kill, Pennsylvania, a couple of years ago, this will tell you how bad things are getting. A correctional officer was beaten to death at school kill, Pennsylvania. They just had one killed out here at CC not so long ago, didn't they? Uh, was that not name? a staff member, it was an inmate. Yeah. Uh, staff member was murdered, beat to death. They put one staff member in a pod with 300 inmates. Mm -hmm. A pod may have 15 cameras. Right. They rely on 15 cameras mm -hmm. to watch a pod with one staff member. You'd never get to him in time. With 300 inmates, okay? They have a staff member working a control center. Mm -hmm. The bubble. 
that's supposed to watch these 15 cameras. Well, they have 15 cameras in this pod. They're in a facility that has seven pods. So there's 15 each, in each one. Mm -hmm. Each pod has 15 cameras. Now, in each one of these pods, even though they have 15 cameras, there are blind spots. That's right. Okay. Now, you have one man watching 15 cameras and seven pods, but this man that's watching all these cameras is detailed to open the institution's entryways to let staff in and out of the institution. Right. He's detailed to do key counts. Mm -hmm. He's detailed to make sure that the institution counts that are coming up from 10, 12, three, and five are accurate. He's detailed to, uh, if an institution emergency happens, to get staff responding to that. That's uh, too much for one person. This is an evening shift. So you probably have one officer in each pod. You probably have two yard officers, a lieutenant, and before 10 o'clock, you probably have recreation staff that are there, uh, and that's it. Yeah, not enough. Even if all of them came, it's not enough because then you can't leave the other pods unoccupied either. This officer gets beat to death. Yeah. This officer's detailed to watch these cameras. This is it. The whole thing? The whole thing. Oh, man. He gets to the point where he can stop what he's doing that, he's, that is his job to do, to look up to see the cameras, and he sees something laying on the gallery that he's not for sure what it is, and he takes the camera that he can view, and he sees that it's an officer laying on the ground. Well, a little late to that situation. Mm, that's unfortunate. They get there, get the officer extracted, get him to a local hospital because nobody ever dies inside a prison. Yeah, of course not. And he died, he's dead. Mm -hmm. This officer, for the next week, continues to go to the uh, employee assistance director, which is a psychologist, and tells the employee assistance director, I'm having trouble sleeping, I'm having nightmares. Mm -hmm. uh, it would, I can't, it would bother you. I can't get over the fact that I let one of my best friends die. It is just eating at me, eating at me. And the psychologist tells him, all you need to do is go home, take a big swig of NyQuil and get a good night's sleep, you'll be okay. Oh no, he needed some type of counseling and probably some time off. The following Saturday, the guy gets up it's the, I believe it's either the day after or the day of the fallen officer's funeral. He calls his father and he tells his father, he says, hey, uh, let's go down to wherever and do some target shooting. Father says, okay. So they go down to this target range and they're target shooting and everything appears to be okay, and he's talking to his son and everything, and he says that everything appears to be doing okay, and he says all of a sudden his son backs out of the, the uh, range booth, and he looks at his dad, and he says, I just can't take this. I let one of my best friends die. Puts the bullet underneath his chin and pulls the trigger. Oh, I can imagine being a parent watching that. Mm -mm. Yeah, it does, it affects everybody. Part of the part of being an institution historian. I don't know if you've been in the staff training center at the prison. Um, every police department, every fire department, every agency that you walk into usually has some type of memorial to their right. fallen officers. Right. For the longest time, Leavenworth never had one. Oh, really? A warden by the name of Inley Connor. I had known him for years. When I first got here, um, he was here, and we became friends. Uh, he always wanted me to move all over the Bureau of Prisons with him. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I had moved a lot when I was a kid, and I just really wasn't you weren't interested mm -hmm. interested. Um, the day that uh, I found out that I could have gone to work for the FBI, Major League Baseball, uh, and transferred out of here as a lieutenant, I found that my wife was pregnant. Okay. Changes things. Uh, that changes the score, particularly since we've been married for eight years and uh, we tried to have kids and we finally uh, decided, well, we ain't going to ever have kids, so we bought a sports car. <laughs> uh, guys, have you ever. Go buy the sports car. <laughs> go buy a sports car. Uh, and, and that changed a lot of things. So uh, he came back as a warden. And I approached him one day and I sat there and I said, hey, you know, uh, and I told him, I said the same thing. I said, you know, all these places have memorial walls and stuff like that. And he says, hey, great idea. He said, get it done by Correctional Workers Week next May. Oh, so you put that in your hands. Cool. Well, the Bureau of Prisons had, at that point in time, 27 officers that had died in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. More officers have died at Leavenworth than any other institution in the federal prison system. Yes. Uh, matter of fact, the very first officer to ever die in the line of duty for the federal prison system died at Leavenworth. Wow. In 1901, he's buried at Mount Muncie Cemetery. Okay. Wow. Um, 100 years ago. And we were... 120. <laughs> I started doing all this research, and I discovered that... There were families that were survivors of these guys all the way back to a captain that had been murdered at the institution in 1924. Oh, wow. His oldest daughter was still alive. Wow. And I had started interviewing the families of the officers and I had started interviewing some of the officers that had been there. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of cool. And I sat across the table from some of the toughest guys I've known and seen them cry like five-year-old oh, yeah. kids. Yeah, over the separate scene. And talk to people that uh, were just their whole life changed mm. because their father didn't come home that night. Right. Oh, absolutely. It affects, it's not just the one person, it affects multiple people. Sure. Okay. Well, we're going to cut call it to a close. Thank you, sure. Ken. I appreciate it. And uh, you guys know where to find me. If you want to do an interview, let me know. And if you need help or need some education on incarceration, get with me. Thanks.